When I was 17, we had a hot day in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So I wore shorts to pick up my dog, from Dewey, from the vet. My legs were exposed, like they are now, the effects of my condition on display. At the vet's office, I sat down next to a woman on her phone. She immediately looked me over and said, you look like you've been mauled by a gorilla. What happened to you? This was not an isolated incident. Like the time I was shopping for my mother and a man told me I was the hottest burn victim he's ever seen. Like the time I was checking out at the grocery store and the older woman in front of me turned to tell me how much she pitied me, how my life would never be fully lived and how that made her sad. Like the time I was filling up my grandmother's car with petrol in Texas, and a group of teenagers, not knowing I could hear them, remarked that I would be hot if it weren't for my weirdo baby hands. Like the time I was speaking to a friend of my brother's, and he asked me if sex would make my vagina fall off. Like the time I went on a date, took my jacket off, and my date recoiled, saying he didn't know there was something wrong with me. And like all the times I can't even remember. So, with these experiences in mind, I thought about what to say, what to tell this woman about myself. What would I tell all these people about myself, my condition, and my experience as a human? Recessive dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa is so rare that you have a greater chance of being struck by lightning than being born with it. And my subtype is so rare that our children will have a 1 in 1.5 million chance of being one in 1.5 million chance of being born with recessive dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa inversa. RDEB is this genetic condition caused by a lack of collagen 7. You can't catch it from being near me. Although this is a simple miscommunication in protein cells, most people are not even aware it even exists. Their absence causes catastrophic damage. Collagen 7 is the connecting fiber that anchors your top layer of skin to your bottom layer of skin. Without it, friction can cause the skin to slip, tear, break, and blister. If I were to trip and fall, instead of getting a bruise, I would receive an injury similar to a third degree burn, which will take weeks to heal. I'm about to show an image that may be upsetting, but these are what the wounds may look like. I have chosen these images because they are so mild to me. This is why my scarring looks similar to burn scars. Because the wounds I received resemble burn wounds. I have them in areas that sustain tr consistent trauma as a child. For me, places that tore repeatedly from learning how to crawl. I am lucky, very, very lucky. Although my scars may look intense and my wounds look very painful, I can still walk, run, wear minimal bandages. I do not have a feeding tube. I have all my hair, and I have every one of my fingers and toes. This is not the case for most adults with RDEB. However, while it is widely known as a skin condition, this is, the skin is not all EB effects. It can affect any internal surface as well, which means injury to your internal organs and most notably your throat, which leaves more scarring. This is the inversa of my diagnosis, RDEB inversa. Inversa means that my insides are much worse than my outsides. I have had over 10 surgeries to correct the scarring in my esophagus. This is a very brief description of what EB is, what it can do to a person. Recessive dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa and junct junctional epidermolysis bullosa are terminal degenerative conditions with a life expectancy of 18 years. So it gets worse, not better. I am now 20. As I stand here speaking to you, there are doctors and labs all over the world who are trying to find a cure to remove the terminal label from our files forever. My mom that says that my specialist doctors referred to me as the girl who lived and the girl who made it to university. But perhaps a better way to expand upon this is to give you an example of a day in our lives. I recognize that my experience differs from many adults with EB, so I will try to be as encompassing as possible. Waking up seems like a simple thing. It begins with opening your eyes. But for those with RDEB or junctional EB, our eyes are fragile as well. When you enter the stage of sleep in which you dream, 
you also enter rapid eye movement sleep. Rapid movement in general is a crapshoot when it comes to EV. I wish this scenario was different, but you know where it's headed. During REM sleep, the surface of our corneas scratch and become an open wound. Even opening your eyes too quickly in the morning can result in a tear. If this occurs, that's it. Your day is spent in bed. This is called a corneal abrasion. This happens to me quite frequently. I have one now and has throughout my life. Luckily, your eyes heal quickly, so it never lasts long. Before you eat breakfast or brush your teeth, you have to be aware of the state your mouth is currently in. Blisters also occur in your mouth, leading to similar open wounds that develop on the body. There's nothing to be done for this. It will be an annoying obstacle for however long it takes to heal, which could be several days. Another thing to be mindful about throughout your day is your throat. Any blisters there? Tightening of scar tissue that makes eating uncomfortable? I do not have a G-tube, but for those of us who do, they may prefer to take their meals through the tube throughout the day. Going about your day from here, for me, is thankfully fairly easy. My feet are relatively wound-free, but when they are, it is difficult to get around, especially in a university town like St. Andrews. I do not have a wheelchair, but if I did, I would always have to think of accessibility. Of course, this is not an issue unique to those with EB, but the friction that would be caused from pushing our wheelchairs with our hands is not ideal, and therefore EB patients use motorized wheelchairs, which present its own set of restrictions onto where one can go independently. At the end of the day, those with EB must take care of themselves. Again, this is where I differ. I have not worn bandages consistently since I was 14. Before that, I wore several layers of bandages from my feet to my thighs and my elbows to my fingers. My wounds are never all encompassing. They stayed contained to areas of previous trauma, so my knees, elbows, and ankles primarily. But many of my friends have no skin across the entirety of their backs, their arms, their legs, feet, and stomachs. No matter the pain involved, these bandages covering these areas must be changed, sometimes once a day, to ensure that infection is prevented. This is a painful process, and not how any of us want to spend our evenings, both patient and caretaker. But until we develop a cure, this is a necessary pain. Tomorrow we will do it all over again. As you can see, a day in life is pretty involved. Those bandages don't come cheap either. I am American, as are many of my friends with EB. Our healthcare system works a bit differently. With the pre-existing condition label now added to our list, the cost of living with EB has not decreased. Many patients still have to pay for their wheelchairs, medicine, dressings, tube feedings, and surgeries that keep our bodies alive. I have a friend named Eileen. She is from my hometown in Texas, a tiny town where cows outpopulate people and she had a baby boy with my subtype of EB. There must be something in the water in Texas. Brady is a beautiful baby boy with people who love him and the future because of the bandages he wears. There is no cure for EB, remember. Our treatment is our bandages and our surgeries. We can't just slap a plaster on. Eileen and Chris have insurance for Brady and receive his bandages from them. A year ago, they received a bill from their insurance company for the same bandages that I get for free here on the NHS, but theirs cost $100,000. That was the charge for keeping their baby alive for seven months, and that was just for bandages. Brady is three years old now. The upkeep for EB does not stop there. I've mentioned that I've had over 10 surgeries on my throat. When I was little, I'd tell my mom that I had a hurt throat. What I didn't have when I was little was the vocabulary to explain what I was experiencing. Scar tissue does not stretch. It contracts. This is an important idea to keep in mind with EB. So after trauma, the scar tissue will contract over time, and that is true for any surface that is heavily scarred. For me, with inversa, that area is my throat. The narrowing of my throat due to scar tissue is called a stricture, or to 13-year-old me, a hurt throat. When I was 13, shortly before school started again, I had another hurt throat. It didn't seem too bad at first. I was way more worried about getting to cheerleading practice on time. I tried to keep eating, things like cheeseburgers to keep up my calorie intake. But then, one morning, I woke up and I couldn't swallow at all. I'd choke on my own saliva, and then I began to cough up blood. It was time for my first surgery. 
So I missed a lot of cheerleading practice. It was a simple surgery. They put me to sleep with a team of EB-friendly anesthesiologists, and they placed a balloon in my throat at the side of the stricture and inflated it. it takes about 15 minutes. That time, although I'd been forcing down cheeseburgers, my throat had an opening of three millimeters. My GI doctor, Dr. Brumbaugh, asked my mom how I'd been eating at all. She told him that I was just really, really stubborn. <laughs> I've had over 10 of these surgeries. I haven't had one since I was 17, but at my worst, I was having them every four months. I'll have them again, but I'm not sure when, until I can't eat cheeseburgers anymore, I guess. Although I have inversa, again, that my insides are worse than my outsides, uh, my throat is not the only area that needs help every now and then. Scar tissue, like I said, does not stretch, it contracts over time. This manifests itself prominently in the hands of those with RDEB. Due to the scarring, I can no longer straighten my hands. An interesting thing about this condition is on places such as my knees, my body does not send the healing signals very often or quickly enough. So the wounds there heal very slowly. However, on hands and feet, something about EB alters the signal to heal and therefore does not send the signal to stop healing. Hence the buildup of scar tissue and the process of mittening. On July 22nd, I'll undergo a surgery to correct this in my hands. I'll be awake for it too, which is a fun fact I'll be sure to bring up at parties in my future. I'm excited for the surgery and I can't wait to get some mobility back. There are, of course, other surgeries. Surgeries to fix the scar tissue on feet. Surgeries to fix the scar tissue on your eyes. Surgeries to remove cancer, to place a feeding tube, even bone marrow transplants. All of them are expensive in America and other places around the world. These surgeries attempt to combat the terminal diagnosis and low life expectancy. It's a part of our upkeep. Our bodies can eventually not take it anymore. Infection and cancer is a real fear. Due to the constant breakdown and regeneration of cells, cancer is usually the cause of death for older patients with EB. I have a good friend I consulted often during this process, and she's now over 30 years old. I want to live to be over 30. I want my friends to live to be over 30. And for that, we need a cure. It seems simple, right? I'm not a scientist. I study art history and classics. I like medieval manuscripts, and I want to be an archeologist or work in an auction house. A lot of people ask me, since the skin is the issue, because it lacks a protein, can't you just do a big modified skin graft on the open areas? No, you cannot. Besides the fact that that would be the largest organ transplant in the world, it, the cure lies in stem cell and gene editing. Our bodies have never produced the protein that we are missing, so we can't just reintroduce it as though it were there all along. My genes and stem cells are currently being edited in a lab called in Colorado, Dr. Root, the director of the Gates Center for Regenerative Medicine and the man in charge of how my cells are being manipulated right now, explained why exactly this is impossible. A big skin graft could mean cancer, as the skin cells turn over so much during the healing and regenerative process that the odds of mutation are high. Gene and stem cell editing allows for a very precise genetic correction of each mutation in each patient. In other words, they will edit the base cells of each patient in order to tell the body to grow what it's missing in a matter that is low risk. So, so far, it has only been tested on mice, not people. This summer, though, I'll be undergoing another stem cell therapy treatment, this time in London. There is simply not enough funding. This is due to lack of awareness. EB is called an orphan disease due to how little is known about it. But it doesn't stop with EB. If we could find a reliable method to correct a genetic defect in the largest organ of the human body, we could also cure the other 3,500 genetic diseases we know of. Because of the lack of long-term treatment, not for lack of trying by our doctors, those with EB are called butterfly children, a label that I, as a capable adult, reject. I am not a child, and neither are the other EB patients past the age of 18. We refuse to be treated like or labeled as children due to a lack of collagen seven. This is the label that we are widely known for, which thrives because most patients with EB are children due to the high mortality rate. But what happens after you turn 18? Will I have this label of child as long as I am alive? 
This is a part of the stigma surrounding disabilities that we are less capable than able-bodied individuals, somehow more childlike, differently, different mentally as well as physically. The media praises those with disabilities who have jobs or meaningful relationships as oddities, but capitalizes on disabilities like EB that are unbelievable in their effects on the human body. So this still furthers the stigma. A documentary once labeled a man with RDEB as the boy whose skin fell off, despite the fact that he was an amazing, strong, and accomplished adult man. Other articles and TV specials blast headlines that state that children with EB can't be hugged, touched, or are even able to know what food tastes like. Mothers of children with EB that I spoke to said in this particular broke their hearts. It makes it seem as though they cannot give affectionate touches to their children and makes others scared to interact. Unfortunately, popular media is not the only area that defines those with disabilities by their disabilities alone. In January of 2017, American Senator Pat Toomey said that ensuring a person with a pre-existing condition like mine would be like ensuring a burned down building due to how little we contribute to society. When I was 17, I thought I was going to die. So I graduated high school early. Turns out I didn't die. So I began my higher education with two semesters of art history at Sotheby's Institute of Art and two semesters of archeology span at Birkbeck College. I saw how I was treated in London versus Texas. In London, I was the least interesting thing walking down the street. And I began to think. I thought of what I could do to bring awareness to not only my condition, but to the topic of visible disabilities in general. So I began to write. And to my amazement, people listened. My first article was published on the Huffington Post before my 18th birthday. I've since been in the New York Post, the Daily Mail, and others, and soon I'll finish writing my book. Studying in London and writing reminded me that the only things EB couldn't touch are my abilities to learn and teach others. This will be my third year of employment at auction houses across London. Do I look like a burned down building to you? <laughs> I'm not the only one. Michelle has a full-time job in New York City. Ariana is a student with straight A's. Kendall runs a farm. Zach is going to college. He wants a wife and a family and to design video games and to be an emergency dispatcher. Ellen wants to be a doctor. Jane wants to design clothes and Alex wants to be a father. Ella wants to be an author and Rowan wants to be a ballerina. Brady is starting preschool. He could be anything. Whatever we are, we will be something. Anyone can contribute to society. I was lucky. As a child, I, got, I was able to go to Camp Spirit in Colorado, a winter camp for children with RDEB. I never felt alone in my condition. But as I grew up, I did feel ashamed. I felt ashamed because of people like Senator Pat Toomey because of the woman at the vet and the people at the grocery store, because of the teenagers in Texas at the petrol station, because of people like Betsy DeVos, even suggesting to take funds away from disability causes reflects the attitude towards differently abled individuals. I felt ashamed because if there was a person with a disability in a movie or TV show, at some point they would be the butt of a joke. I felt ashamed because with the knowledge people had of disabilities due to the media, people assumed I couldn't have sex and would never be viewed as attractive. This idea furthers the stigma around sexuality and disabilities or lack of sexuality and disabilities. This is due to a lack of awareness. When there is no awareness in the media created by people who have a firsthand knowledge of the disabilities that they are discussing, people are led to make their own assumptions. These assumptions are hurtful, even whenever they are not meant to be. With EB, when it is mentioned in the media, it is only the worst of our condition on display. This is done to sensationalize a condition or a person as other for shock value and for views. Although there are others like me, there was no positive representation in the media to speak of when it came to those with scars. The words I have written have reached a wide international audience, and for that, I am thankful.
But reading my words was not as potent as seeing me, seeing my scars, and therefore my life. So, much to my mother's joy, I took off my clothes and modeled lingerie. <laughs> I've walked in a fashion show, posed for Sophia Mayan's Behind the Scars project on Instagram, and will be campaigning for Jeans for Jeans. Maybe, if someone who looks like me can be seen in the media, people with scars won't be made to feel ashamed anymore. When the woman in the vet asked what happened to my body, I told her, motorcycle accident. After a second of looking at the rest of me, but never my eyes, she went back to her phone and replied, at least your face was spared. And I'm going to use it if that's what it takes to spread awareness. Bridges can be built by all of us, able-bodied and differently abled individuals. They are being built. We're building them right now. You're building them by attending this talk. This is all just a part of what I'd like to say to all those people. But I'm not done yet. I want to tell them that, not despite my condition, but with my condition, I have felt love unimaginable. Like the time my boyfriend brought me popsicles when the wounds in my mouth made it too painful for me to eat solid food. Like every time my doctors have held my hands while I was shaking from fear on the operating table. Like when my brother and sister made me laugh all the days I couldn't see. Like how my grandmother in Texas prays for a cure every morning when she wakes up. Like when my friends ask how I am every single day in case I need their help. Like the times when I was little, when my mother would sing to me as she removed and applied every one of my bandages. And like every other time, I have felt hope, not despite my condition, but because of it. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs>